And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Ask not what America will do for you, but what together we can do for the freedom of man. In the first grade, my elder teacher used to have four big pictures of U.S. presidents hanged up on her wall. When asked by the children on who exactly were those men, she replied simply that the first man was the first president of the United States, the second man freed the slaves, and the third man was the current president at that time. The fourth man, however, was the only one who was in a painting or in a colored photo. And when asked exactly who he was, she would simply reply that he was her favorite president throughout her entire lifetime. Over time, I would eventually learn more about the man who could never tell a lie, and also how Abraham Lincoln didn't really technically free the slaves. Meanwhile, the third man came and went, as he was replaced by someone else, as presidents typically do. While the fourth man, Jack Kennedy and my thoughts on him, significantly changed. A president's character and personality can influence decades. Theodore Roosevelt's bullish character had helped push tired workers through the Progressive Era and into the trenches of World War I under the ambitious Wilson in the 1910s. FDR's fireside chats in the sense that he was a close friend to the typical American helped soldiers storm through the Pacific during the Second World War with eagerness to get back home to their loved ones. Communication is key in order to have a decent public approval rating among the individuals within the country. If one does not have the ability to communicate well, their presidency begins to fumble and collapse upon itself, as seen with Richard Nixon and Jimmy Carter. Arguably, the most beloved president following 1945 isn't Eisenhower, it isn't Bill Clinton, or even the Gipper. It's a man who didn't even get to complete his first term in office. <laughs> In 1960, a charismatic young senator from Massachusetts won a victory against the current vice president at that time, Richard Nixon. Arguably because of a last minute call by John Kennedy to the family of a Baptist named Martin Luther King Jr. while he was spending a night in jail. This move that was done around a week before the 1960 election basically won Kennedy the black vote, and in a way also won him the election as Kennedy only won the so-called swing states by razor thin margins. Much like the 2016 election, it was contested, but the major difference between the two elections is the reaction of the results. America in the early 1960s wasn't divided politically, but it was, however, divided racially. At first that may sound contradictory, but keep in mind, JFK's public approval rating was a solid 70-ish percent, and at the time of the fateful day in Dallas, Texas, in 1963, it was a 58 percent. When your presidency begins with a crisis in Cuba and a near full-scale nuclear war only around a year later, one can say that being president back then required tons of experience and stamina, but it also required the will of the American people to back their president. Although JFK may have been young when he was elevated into the presidency, stamina was unfortunately not on his side. John had tremendous back problems, also known as osteoporosis, leading to bones becoming fragile. So what exactly kept him going throughout his presidency? Although it may sound cheesy, medication and treatment aside, it was really the people backing him, who were giving Kennedy the energy to continue with his policies. Maybe it was because of the fear of a nuclear war due to the classic capitalism versus communism debate that used to unite the country or maybe it was because America just had good faith in their leader and his competence to do the job at hand. When Khrushchev, the Soviet leader at that time, said that Western children were going to be raised under communism and that the Soviet Union was going to bury the United States, it was Kennedy who stood up, who traveled to the Berlin Wall and made his famous Ike Bin Yain Berliner speech without fear. Kennedy thought that it was the future that didn't belong to communism, but it was that the idea of freedom itself belonged to the future. And when the world was under the threat of full nuclear Armageddon in October of 1962 during the Cuban Missile Crisis, Kennedy spent many sleepless nights trying to figure out ways to prevent war. In arguably the closest moment to a possible World War III, almost everybody within his cabinet thought he should airstrike Cuba, but Kennedy held back knowing it would surely lead to the destruction of the planet. It was at that moment, which I personally believe is his finest moment, where he wasn't thinking about being President of the United States, but rather considering about the survival 
of the entire human species as a whole. Perhaps that is why Kennedy is so loved. Kennedy stood up for what he believed in and was thoughtful about it. When he said that America would put a man on the moon by the end of the decade, he wasn't kidding. We landed on the moon in 1969, nearly six years after his death. The assassination in itself deserves its own video, but the reaction to it must be discussed in this one. The true start of the dividing point in America started with Kennedy's death. That's when we truly started to split as a society. Maybe it's just because the official account by the government isn't good enough for them. And maybe it's because they can't accept that it may have been just this one loner named Oswald who shot the president and changed history within an instant. I do agree. It's frustrating to think that someone so insignificant can do something so earth shattering. Trust in government faded in almost an instant following the event. And that perhaps is more harmful than what happened to Kennedy himself. The death of Kennedy changed the direction of the 1960s and American history beyond that. But yet, his legacy is still alive. Unlike the presidents who succeeded him, almost everyone can look at Kennedy fondly because to this day, he still inspires. People admire him and his character. Maybe one day there will be another president who shares similar attributes to John and who people also see as inspiring. But even then, there will still only be one Jack Kennedy. I stand here tonight facing west on what was once the last frontier. The pioneers gave up their safety, their comfort, and sometimes their lives to build our new west. Beyond that frontier are uncharted areas of science and space, unsolved problems of peace and war, unconquered province of ignorance and prejudice, unanswered questions of poverty and surplus. But I believe that the times require imagination and courage and perseverance. I'm asking each of you to be pioneers towards that new frontier. <laughs>